and uh, we are going in to welcome our second speaker. Um, one of the things we do at our conference is, um, I, I, maybe it's more of the way I am, I'm just a very simple person and I just stay on track. Um, I told, I've told people that I'm not a gifted person, I'm not extraordinarily gifted, but I'm a focused person. So I keep my focus and try to stay with something and see it through. And, and so we don't change our speakers too much. If I get one good speaker, I'm going to stick with the speaker, that's it. <laughs> you know, I, I get one thing that works, that's it. I stay with it and, and move on with my life. I'm not too much into changing things and uh, just trying to uh, make sure that something works and, and I make it better all the time. So we keep our speakers uh, uh, pretty much every year and uh, it doesn't get boring. It gets better and better. Uh, and, and, and so Bishop Bismarck is one of the constants of our church and of our conference. And since I've known him, he's been speaking every year except COVID uh, years when nobody was speaking anywhere. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we are glad to have him back with us. Uh, and, and with Pastor Chichi, uh, Bishop Bismarck is a, a, and, and Chichi a dear friend of ours, my wife and I. We treasure their friendship and, and the relationship we have with them. Uh, it goes beyond the pulpit uh, to, to being friends and, and cherishing one another. I speak for him also. But life is not about speaking for people. It is about knowing people and building relationships with them. And that's very important to me as a person. And it should be important to all of us that we build good relationships. But the fact that you are related to somebody or you know somebody doesn't mean that you don't also see their uniqueness. And this man right here is an extraordinary man. Uh, he, he is anointed. He's supremely gifted. Uh, he is an eloquent speaker. Uh, he is an intensive man. He's a man of the spirit. He's a man of power. And God has raised his ministry to extraordinary heights. I, I can say boldly that on the continent uh, of Africa, no African preacher circulates in the world as much as Bishop Bismarck uh, does. Every time uh, we talk, he's somewhere else. He's preaching everywhere. Uh, and, uh, and God continues to use him in, in very high places, very significant places. And I'm grateful that he chooses to come to our conference to speak to us each year. Uh, he heads up the Jabula New Life uh, Covenant Ministry, New Covenant Ministries all over, uh, beginning from Zimbabwe, but spread all over the world. Uh, God is doing phenomenal things through him. And any ministry at this time uh, that does well in Zimbabwe uh, is anointed because Zimbabwe has gone through many, many economic crises, uh, but he has stuck with Zimbabwe. He hasn't run away from Zimbabwe and he's building in Zimbabwe. He has medical missions in Zimbabwe, orphanages in Zimbabwe and trying to make a difference even when the other guys are trying to make life difficult for us. We're still trying very hard to make life work for God's people. Uh, and Bishop Bismarck continues to be a groundbreaker and a trailblazer. Uh, it is my honor to welcome my very dear friend, Bishop Tudor Bismarck. Bishop Tudor Bismarck is one of Africa's leading Christian voices an apostolic father and a guide to many ministries across the globe. He is a highly sought after conference speaker and a prolific writer. He serves as chairman of the Council of African Apostles, an assembly of apostolic leaders of African ministries who meet to deliberate on uniquely African issues. Bishop Bismarck and his wife, Pastor Chichi, live in Harare, Zimbabwe where they serve as senior pastors of Jabula New Life Covenant Church. Let's rise to our feet as we welcome Bishop Tudor Bismarck.
Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Please take your seats. God bless you. It is an honor and a privilege to be uh, with Dr. Otterville, Lady Joy, a wonderful family, this great church and ministry. And a real honor to be part of Greater Works. Teach uh, and I have decided a long time ago whether we are speaking at certain conferences or not, we will attend. And so, when we do our annual calendar, we seek first Greater Works Conference, uh, Bishop Michael Conquest Kingdom Way Conference, uh, Ashim Lowe's Conference, whether we are speaking or not, because we're, we're covenant relationships. And there's so much that we, uh, we learn. And Bishop Okonkwe is right in the fact that uh, we learn so much and we glean so much. And I'm an avid note taker. I take notes on everything. And uh, I was taking notes, for example, this morning on the need for inner ear monitors, why we need them, because... Uh, it, it is essential, and so literally, for, from colors to patterns to everything, uh, I take notes on everything because we want to impart what we learn to others and other generations. And then to follow Bishop Amazou, you know the French are such romantic people. Their language is so beautiful, they just have to say something in French and we all fall in love. God bless you guys. Amen. I'm going to speak to you for about 40 minutes. Uh, I've chosen not to have a presentation for the screens because I intend to preach this message and I'm going to do my best to leave everything here in this session. My subject today is revival. Revival. I'm in Genesis chapter number 45 and verse 27, Psalm 85 verse 6, Luke chapter number 4 verse 17. Father, thank you for blessing this word. Thank you for grace in this service. I pray for an outbreak of untarnished, unprecedented revival. Let it begin with me, let it begin with every person as an individual, and let it extend far and beyond in Jesus' name. And they told Jacob all the words of Joseph which he had said to them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Look at verse 28. And Israel said, so in two words, he goes from Jacob, he goes to his promised name, Israel. And Israel said, it is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Psalm 85 and verse 6, please. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Please say three times, revive me. 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 Say it with the spirit of revival. Say, revive me. Revive me. Oof. Revive me. Revive me. I didn't mean you to shout at me. <laughs> 
In 1974, I had just turned 17, my father sent me to a place in Zimbabwe called Buhera. It's in the rural areas. It's probably about 160 kilometers from Harare. And at that time, the war, the liberation war in Zimbabwe had heightened. And uh, that area was a very hot spot. There were so many freedom fighters that were killed there. In fact, I'd gone to preach for Pastor Guebu. His father, Chief Guebu, was the chief in that area. And I was with, at that time, my best friend. You have to understand the uh, apartheid dynamics. Uh, Moses in Lover and I were the same age. And because of the different restrictions that were imposed on us because of apartheid, a South African type, uh, we weren't allowed to mix. But we became so close that weekends I'd spend at their house in what they called the township of Mpopoma, and some weekends he'd spend with us. And so the school holidays, my dad was working at a place called Dabuka, building a train marshalling yard. And uh, we were playing uh, football with a tennis ball. And Moses kicked a stone and broke his toe and couldn't walk. My father said, you, are, you guys are naughty guys. All the reason, the more you are going to the bush to go and preach. And so I had my guitar. I had a little bag with some groceries. And we went with James and Lovo, an older man, who was born with a club foot. His toe was touching his shin, and he walked basically on his heel. And so when we got to the main area uh, of Bohera, we caught a train, then a bus. We were then asking the people, you know, we're looking for Chief Guebu's place. How, you know, far, how close is it? And so they were saying, ah, Paduze, which means it's right here. You know, African people, when we say it's right here, <laughs> you must know you're going to walk for. And we walked. So Moses is walking like this. James is walking like this. I remember we got there about three, four in the morning. And uh, we went straight into the revival services. I was 17 years old. The last night of the revival, the message I preached was run. And as I was preaching, the Holy Spirit spoke a word to me. Because the miracles that were taking place there was actually a man that was baptized by a certain church and he died in the water. Moses and myself went to go and pray for that man. He was revived. And the revival was so incredible. And then the Lord spoke a word in my spirit and said, I'm going to send you to revival places in the world. Sisters and brothers, that was 49 years ago. And I've asked the Lord, every single time I ask the Lord, send me to revival places. We understand that Africa is going to be the custodian for Christianity. We understand that. We, at the Council of African Apostles uh, Roundtable Zoom call, Bishop Mark Sharona addressed us so ably and so mightily and so powerfully and affirmed and confirmed the fact that Africa will be the, the last bastion of hope for Christianity as we know it. And along with that, we as Africans are attesting to the fact that we will gladly and are gladly hosting an X-type revival. And so as I'm preaching to you, I want you to think about one person, just one person that you want to win to the Lord. Every single year, I pray that God will cause me to win at least one soul. Just one soul. And so there's an individual that we've been working on him for 22 years. 22 years. This January was his first time coming to church. 
And he gave his heart to the Lord. He told me just before I, I left uh, Harari, he said, I want to be baptized. And uh, he said, Bishop, I just would like you to please baptize me. Because I don't baptize people anymore. I'm not strong enough. So I said, I'll gladly baptize you. There's one person that we have been praying for from 1978. One person that Chich and I have been praying for from 1978. And slowly, 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 the man is coming. Through his wife, through the children. We are patient with him. We don't do any religious overtones because our life is a testimony. And we're asking God for revival to begin with our family first before it spreads throughout our nation and throughout the continent. Shout, I need revival. Need revival. revival is so key for, for solving Africa's challenges. And uh, from the age of 17, up until now, I've been seeking revival. I've been to great revivals in the world, preached at many revivals. I just left uh, Daphne, Alabama, where John Kilpatrick is the pastor. He is the pastor known for the Pensacola revivals. And so when the Pensacola revivals began, it actually began on a Father's Day. And uh, Pastor Kilpatrick was telling me that that Father's Day, they were trying to get out of church early. Uh, they had been engaged in seven years of daily prayer every day from six in the morning to six in the evening. And they'd imported an intercessor by the name of Pastor Lila from Argentina that came to head the intercessory prayer movement. And uh, he said they were pushing. So on Father's Day, they were trying to get out early because it's very difficult to get restaurants. You know, Americans don't really cook at home. They generally eat out. And so they wanted to get out early because Father's Day is very celebrated and rightfully so. And uh, he said just before he was about to release the congregation, uh, something hit him. And when he opened his eyes five hours later, there were people on the floor. There were people that had been slain by the power of God. Some had seen angels. One young lady had a visitation from the Lord himself. And he said that the service went from 11, started at 9, went from 9 all the way into the evening service. The next day, the same thing. And that revival began to multiply. It went two days, three days, a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, three months, every single day, four months, five months, six months, a year, two years, every single day. My brother, uh, who's the fourth in the family, had uh, gone to be in the revival. He was in the queue to get into the church. The queue was three days long, three days long to get into the church. And he was telling me, uh, I preached several times during that revival. I saw it for myself. Their building is just a little smaller than this one. It would take two minutes to fill up. And along the way, they have, would have big screens for people to be watching the revival. That revival literally transformed Pensacola. He got a phone call one day from the Pensacola airport saying, Pastor Kilpatrick, there's a 747 from Japan that's trying to land here. The runway is not long enough. The pilot is requesting if you can please organize transportation because the nearest place for them to land is uh, going to be about 500 kilometers away. And so a plane load, a 747 plane load of Japanese believers came to that revival. There were, there were people that came from literally every nation to witness that revival. It was absolutely stunning. That revival caused Pensacola Airport to become an international airport. I just flew in there a few weeks ago. Uh, they built probably 160 new hotels, uh, over 300 new restaurants, 
expanded the freeways, expanded the fire department, expanded uh, the police department, and there were literally hundreds and hundreds of people that came to Pensacola to get jobs, not even to be part of the revival, to get jobs, because the revival was attracting most of those people. And Pastor Gil Patrick was telling me, as I witnessed, that the Holy Spirit, they'd start service about seven, about half past 10, half past 11, that's when the power of God would start falling. They used, they were, their song, revival song, was Shout to the Lord that came out of Australia. And when they start singing Shout to the Lord, the anointing was, would be so thick. So in one of the services I was there, just bear with me, I'm working my case. In one of the services, uh, Pastor Kilpatrick stood up, and when he opened his mouth to pronounce healing, an arrow about that long, he was the only one that saw it, a silver arrow hit a woman right here in her chest, and she fell down. And when she fell down, the power of God touched a man that she was next to, and people around there started screaming because they, when, when John got there, he witnessed a creative miracle. A man had lost his arm in Vietnam in the war, and when John got there, he saw the last two fingers extending and growing. That's the nature of that revival. And so when I was with him a couple of weeks ago, that anointing has begun again in their world. And I'm telling you, I'm, I was standing on the platform, the anointing was so thick, I couldn't even open my mouth to speak. I tried to say a few words, I was just praying in tongues. And uh, he was saying to me that this kind of anointing here is going to need more apostolic direction than what we had in the past. He said, we mismanaged that anointing. He said, we were processing people. We never developed a strong church. We never developed leaders. He said, we had hundreds of thousands of people come through. He said, our organization was very, very weak. He was part of the Assemblies of God, still is. They had rejected that move of God as an authentic move of God. But what he has now done, he's now organizing revival centers. And he said to me, Bishop, please pray for me. Please pray for me. I need the revival that's in Africa to come on me and to come on America. He said, our country is in so much trouble. He said, our country is so far from God. He said, the only thing that's going to cure America is an Africa-type revival. And so we pray for him all the time. Chich and I were in Sweden eight years ago to preach for uh, a Swedish guy, blue eyes, blonde-haired people. And uh, we preached three nights. The last night he was holding my coat like this. And he said to me, Bishop, please, please send me Africans. He said, please, can you send me Africans? He said, our country is so desperate for revival. These people are God-haters. He said, I want Africans. I said, no, we want our Africans. He says, no, please give us your Africans because they're teaching us how to pray. They're teaching us how to honor. They're teaching us how to give. They're teaching us how to respect. They're teaching us how to love God. And so uh, we, we grabbed, they brought flags from African nations and we anointed them there and prayed and said, he said, the only thing I'm really wanting, I'm wanting revival in Sweden. I was just leaving Pensacola. There was a couple from uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. They had heard we were preaching at that revival for John Kilpatrick. The man said to me, he said, please, can you come to Copenhagen? We want a revival in Denmark. People are so far from God. And the man standing next to him was from Norway. They said, can you and Pastor Chichi come and spend a month? We'll share you with the Scandinavian countries. He said, we don't have a good, strong representation from Finland, but Norway, Sweden, Denmark, we desperately need a revival. Somebody shout, we need a revival. We need a revival. I am so hungry for a genuine move of God. I'm so hungry for an untarnished move of God. And so 
the bad news comes that Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. And they bring his coat of many colors sprinkled with goat blood and show it to Jacob. And that man died that day. Jacob, a light went out in his spirit. He just, he died that day. And those evil brothers, those evil sons, watched that man. They watched him get a twitch, watched him shrink, watched the light go out when they knew what they had done. And when they are revealed, when Joseph recognizes them, and he reveals himself and says, Go and tell my dad I'm still alive. The Bible says that when J Jacob heard the word that Joseph was alive, his spirit revived again. His spirit revived again. My heart is so full for our continent, for our nation Zimbabwe. Please remember us in your prayers. Because in three weeks, we are going to the, to the polls. We have a general election. And what is going to help our country is going to be revival. Not good church. We'll do that, but we need a revival. Shout, I need a revival. Shout, I need a revival. And so it begins with us. It begins with us. It begins within us. And so on the 15th of April, 1935, after eight years of massive drought, a purple-blue cloud began to come over the prairies of Oklahoma. And in a few hours, those blue clouds dumped 600 million gallons of water on a drought parched land in Oklahoma, ending a huge famine. That's the kind of revival we're looking for, where an Acts chapter 2, an Acts chapter 8, an Acts chapter 10, an Acts chapter 19 revival hits our continent, where God moves in a phenomenal and specific way. We're asking God now for this revival to impact every hamlet, every village, every place. I want to uh, go to Acts chapter number 8 and verse 3. Acts chapter number 8 and verse 3. And Saul made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hauling men and women, and committed them to prison. Therefore, the church was scattered abroad, and the word of God was being preached everywhere. Then Philip, whose colleague had just been killed, Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed to the things which Philip spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For demons were coming out of people, and many that were possessed of them, many crippled were healed, the lame were healed, and there was great joy in the city. That's the kind of revival we're looking for. Yes, we'll plant churches. Yes, we'll train ministers. Yes, we'll organize conferences. But the kind of revival I'm looking for is a Pensacola type revival. The kind of revival I'm looking for is an Azusa type revival. The revival that I'm looking for is a, a a Canadian Latter Rain Movement revival. Uh, Mark Sharona, uh, his mom, Lady Victoria, uh, I would partner with her in conferences, and she was one of the uh, founding members of the Latter Rain Movement, and she would she would tell me stories of how the Holy Ghost was poured out in Canada in the Latter Rain Movement. She said they used to start singing, God is moving by his spirit, moving all over the world. Signs and wonders where God's moving, move O spirit in me. She said when they'd sing that song, when they start singing that song, uh, she and Violet Kitely, when they, they start praying for people, the anointing would come so thick. She said one time, 
she, she even forgot to feed her baby because she was in the anointing for 18 hours. 18 hours in thick anointing with great miracles and signs and wonders. And I'd say to her, Mama Violet, please tell me more. Tell me more. I preached with Gwen Shaw. She came from the Argentine prayer rooms and began in time handmaidens. She also came out of a, a Canadian revival. And I'd say to her, Sister Gwen, please tell me about that revival. Tell me about how God's hand was moving. Share what God has done in your life. When Pastor Matthew mentions uh, Babaloa and stuff like that, my heart churns and jumps. I get so excited because I know that there's hope for Africa. I know that there's hope for our generations. I know that there's hope for our future. Because we are saying to the Lord, trust us with that kind of revival. Trust us with those kinds of miracles. Trust us with those signs and wonders. Shout, Lord, revive me. Shout, Lord, revive me. Before I came to this conference, I was at the, we now on our church ground. And my custom is to prepare in prayer. And so from nine o'clock in the morning until four in the afternoon, I'm on the land where we've taken possession. And all that time, I'm walking and praying and asking God to bless. These meetings, it would be almost immoral for somebody to stand behind this pulpit without being covered by deep intercessory prayer and fasting. Be because a price has to be paid and a price is being paid. And the reward is coming with God bringing a revival of unprecedented proportions. Shout, Lord, revive me. Shout, Lord, revive me. And so, sisters and brothers, uh, in Nehemiah chapter number 1 and verse 3, they brought a report about the condition of Jerusalem, how the people were scattered, how that they were um, messed up. And the Bible says in verse number 4, that when Nehemiah heard these words, he sat down and he wept and mourned for many days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. When we hear the news of what's happening in Francophone countries, when we see the challenges that are taking place in Mozambique, the problems that we see in South Africa, our hearts churn and are, are troubled because we want better for our continent. We want better for our people and we know that God will make a way. We understand that God will send a revival and the God of heaven will hear us. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways. He said, then I will hear from heaven. And then he says, I will heal their land. Second Chronicles 7, 14. I will heal their land. Zimbabwe needs to be healed. South Africa needs to be healed. Thank God for what's taking place in parts of this country. But the revival that we so desire will come. And so Noah wanted a revival and God gave him a revival. Deborah wanted a revival, and God gave Deborah Barak, and they got a revival. Samuel wanted a revival, and God caused Samuel, his words never to fall to the ground, and he was granted his revival. Elijah wanted a revival, and witnessed single-handedly on Mount Carmel, the fire of God come down. He mocked the false prophets of Baal. He said, maybe your God's taken a nap. Maybe your God's gone to Dubai on a shopping trip. He said, uh, I think I'll just goof around here. And he prays a very simple prayer. And the Bible says that the fire of God came down, fell on that altar, consumed the sacrifice, licked up the water. And a revival began because he said, you guys are halting between two opinions. The God that answers by fire, let him be God. God is about to answer by fire. The true church is going to be identified by true signs and wonders. Amen. Prophet Anna, you have believed that. You have predicted it. You will see it with your eyes. You will touch it with your hands. You will speak with it out of your mouth. The furnace in your spirit is going to set ablaze all kinds of things. Shout, I've got to have a revival. 
Father, give me a double portion revival like you gave Elisha. I've got to have a revival. I want an Isaiah revival. I want to see the Lord high and lifted up and his train filling the temple. Fill the house with smoke. Let there be a visible haze of your presence here. Let the anointing be so thick that we won't even be able to manage how to do this and that because we'll all be drunk in the Holy Spirit. Where we can say that these men are not drunk as ye suppose. I want us to be so drunk in the Holy Spirit. God, please give me a revival. Give someone a high vibe and say, I need a revival. I've been weeping, Jeremiah, but a revival is coming. Daniel, a revival is coming. You'll be in a lion's den. A revival is coming. John the Baptist, you preached all these years. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. A revival is coming, John. And you will see it. You will witness it. You will testify of it. I'm asking the Lord God Almighty to give me the boldness of John to give me the anointing of an Elijah, a double portion of an Elisha, a weeping spirit of a Jeremiah, the eloquent sisters and brothers of an Isaiah, the foresight and knowledge of an Ezekiel, a double portion like Hagar. I'm asking God to make me a prisoner of hope like Zechariah. I'm asking God to open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing, Malachi. I'm asking you, God, to send me a blessing like you gave Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Send fire in my spirit. Send a revival, a revival that outlasted Paul, a revival that outlasted Irenaeus and Polycarp. Send a revival like you gave Martin Luther. Send a revival like you gave Seymour. Send a revival that shakes the root and the core of our continent. I'm not gonna rest until I see that revival. Every day I'm laboring in prayers for a move of God such as we have never had. So rise black stars, rise with power in your wings, rise black stars with an anointing of revival. God has promised an outpouring to this nation. Thank God for what has taken place. Sisters and brothers, I just got a message that Archbishop Margaret Idiosa turned 80 years old yesterday and celebrating the revival of what her husband brought years ago. Father, we need that kind of boldness. We need that kind of revival. We need that kind of power. We need what Philip had in Samaria. We need what Peter had in Cornelius' house. We need what Paul had when he preached to those in Ephesus. Give me a revival in a midnight hour. Let the jailhouse be shaken. Let the power of God be demonstrated. Pour out your spirit on all flesh. I'm asking you, God, to touch my lips and put fire in my spirit. Pour grace on my life. Pour power on my life. Cause me to be a miracle walker. Cause me to cause signs and wonders to follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the... Come on, give someone a high five. Say revival. Shall revival. Two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. Two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. When I landed in Accra yesterday, which seems like a year ago, I got a message that the missionary, I was the pastor who sent the missionary to Zimbabwe in 1972. His name is Kenneth Phillips. And Kenneth Phillips passed away yesterday. And uh, I was so moved with emotion because he thought he had failed. 
and he left a message for me because he's been checking on me for all these years. And he told his son, he said, please tell Tudor that he is the jewel of my ministry that I thought had failed. The way that that missionary was sent to Zimbabwe, Brother Phillips was having revival services on the campuses of Austin, Texas. And Robin Ferris and Susan Ferris gave their heart to the Lord. They were Hare Krishnas. Uh, Robin was uh, high all the time. They were orange. They were doing chants. And so they got saved in a Kenneth Phillips revival. And they sent Robin and Sue Ferris to get them out of their drug world as kids sent them to Zimbabwe. They came to Zimbabwe when it was still Rhodesia. I was just 16 years old. And he came, they came and knocked on our door. I'll never forget that day. My mother was leaving my dad that day. She had enough. She said, I'm Danetta with this man. He's drinking too much. And uh, her father, Mohammed, my grandfather, said to her, no, Shirley, come. Come with the children. We have space here on the farm. We look after them. And so my mother was getting her things together. It was a Saturday. These two missionaries came and knocked on our door. And uh, we thought they might have been maybe Jehovah's Witnesses or something. Because my mother was seeking. And they knocked on the door. And my mother started crying. Now, I'm the oldest of ten. You know, I, I said, what are you crying for? You don't even know these people. These Muzungu people, you're just crying here. She said, my heart is touched. I said, your heart is always touched. <laughs> so she agreed to go to church that night. And we went to a girl guide hall, Lobengula Street in Blyam. And... Uh, People, you know, the, the preacher was trying to say something, because I went to a Catholic school. You know, it's like all this and stuff we were doing, the priest would be monotone. And so now the guy's trying to say something, and people are shouting, Amen! And one is, you know, they... And I said, why are these people making so much noise and misbehaving? So now at the end of the service, my mother says, I want to say something, so I pulled her like this. She says to me, leave me, I want to say something. So these are strangers. Remember, these are strangers. My mother starts telling them all our, our, our stories and our nyaya. <laughs> oh, you are, my mother to give her that day. <laughs> and uh, so Robin Ferris and Sue Ferris came around us and began to pray for us. And so I thought I was crying because my mother was crying. I only realized that I was crying because the Holy Spirit had touched my heart. That was in 1972. A few weeks later, Brother Ferris called me. He said, uh, I, I think that you are a preacher. He says, I want you to do two things for me. I want you to fast every Wednesday, and I want you to ask God to give you a burden for souls. And he said, if you'll do that, if you get a burden for souls, revival will always follow you. Will always follow you. And so Robin Ferris is now late. His wife, Sister Susan Ferris, is still alive. She comes to see me regularly. She's in her 80s. And so with Brother Phillips passing away yesterday, it took me back to 1972. How God arranged a revival in Austin, Texas to reach a family in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. And through his commitment to revival and his commitment to souls being saved, I have the unique and distinct honor to address this august church and ministry. Where one man who committed to revival has made a difference. I certainly hope that I've made a difference in my generation. And I certainly hope I've made a, a contribution how could I fail Kenneth Phillips now and his uh, wife, Mama Rhonda? How can I fail them now? I have to be a custodian and a carrier of revival. So God send a revival 
to Abidjan. God send a revival to Niger. God send a revival to Malawi. God send a revival to Tanzania. And God don't forget North Africa. Send a revival to the North Africans from Egypt all the way to uh, Algeria. Send a revival of unprecedented proportion. God set our continent alight with the fire of revival. Set our spirits alight with a power of revival. These signs shall follow them that believe. Anoint my hands to be a miracle worker. Anoint my hands to open blind eyes. Talk to your hands, say you are anointed. Anoint my hands to unstop deaf ears. Let the dumb speak, let the cripple walk. I'm asking you, God, to trust me with revival. Anoint me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Raise up revival in my spirit. I feel like Jacob now when I saw the young people singing and worshiping God. My spirit has become revived. Revival! 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 I'm calling you. Come sit on my head. Come sit on my life. Can I push a little harder for revival on every woman, every man, every boy, and every girl? Stand up and clap your hands, everybody. The drought is over. The famine is ended. The rain is coming. The power is falling. The grace is given. The miracles have begun. Prosperity has arrived. As for me and my house, we are a revival house. Oh God, bless me, anoint me for revival purposes. Bless Dr. Archibald, bless ITGC, bless this great ministry, and trust with revival. Can I show up? Dress up. <laughs> Amen. Say revival is mine. Now own it. Come on, own it. Own it. Revival is mine. Come on, pray, pray. I own revival. Revive my spirit. Everybody watching, wherever you are, own revival. Own it. Possess it. Take it. Devil, you will not destroy this continent. We own revival. Revive me in my spirit that your name might be praised. Turn to three women and say revival is on your life. I said turn to three women and say revival is on your life. Hallelujah. Revival is on your life. There's a revival coming to the women. There's a revival coming to the women. Ah, ah yes. There's a revival, there's a revival, there's a revival. Can you feel revival? Can you taste revival? Can you handle revival? Shout three times, me Lord. Me Lord. Me Lord. Come on, pray for the Holy Spirit to anoint you with revival. Pray hard, pray hard for the Holy Spirit to anoint you with revival.
you might be on your way back to Addis, being in the temple worshiping God. And Philip will be taken from Samaria and will be joined to your chariot. And the man will ask, who is this man riding to? Do you understand what you are reading? Father, help me to read the signs of the times, to read the anointing of the day, to read the revival that is being preserved, the revival that is being pushed. Send me a revival. Shout three times, send me a revival. Send me a revival. Send me, send me a revival. I want to impart a small prayer that is preempted by a little story. I'd gone to Honduras to preach. One of the things that uh, has kind of like followed my ministry from about the year 2000 is that people started throwing, would throw money on the altar while I was preaching. It started in our church and uh, I didn't like it, you know? And the Lord said, leave it, it's me. And so I then preached for Bishop Jakes at his conference and people, I mean, for almost one hour were throwing money on the altar. And so there was an individual that had seen that uh, clip and invited me to preach at their conference, Apostle Maldonado, in the American Airlines uh, arena in Miami. And in the middle of my message, the same thing began to happen. And there was a certain gentleman there, I only learned later, that was desiring for me to come to Honduras. So we went to Honduras, long story short. They wanted me to teach on prosperity because of the poverty in that city. And they had Cash Luna from Guatemala to come and do the miracle signs and wonders. And so as it would happen, you know, God has a sense of humor. God flipped the script. <laughs> the signs and wonders were being carried by myself. And Luna found himself having to teach on prosperity. And so uh, as I got up to speak, I was so shocked because the first thing that happened, this anointing came and pulled my jacket and said, be quiet, it's me. I then saw about eight people start running out of wheelchairs. These weren't fabricated people that were paid to come out of wheelchairs. You could actually see their, their limbs were twisted. But the greatest miracle of all those, Bishop, the greatest miracle, there was a little child like this that was brought. And they said this child is 15 years old. I said, really? And as they were bringing the child to the platform, I saw that child stretch out and grow up to be a 15-year-old. That's the kind of revival I need. That's the kind of revival I want. In Guatemala, the kinds of anointing there, even the land has been healed. Cabbages and carrots are growing extraordinarily because God has not just healed the people, he's healed the land. Father, heal our land. I said, Father, heal our land. Father, heal our land. Heal this city. Cleanse our continent. Cleanse Zimbabwe. We repent of all the blood that's been spilt illegally. And we ask you to heal our land. You've called us by your name. You've forgiven us of our sin. Now send us a revival. Send us a revival. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Come on, ask the Lord to pour his spirit out on you. Pour out your spirit on me. Pour out your spirit on me. Pour out your spirit on Dreen and Tari, Eden and Idris, Jason and Ta Tadiwa, Amelia, TJ, Lashan, Aurora. Pour out your spirit on our sons and daughters. Pour out your spirit on New Life Covenant Church in the name of Jesus. Put your hands together, everybody. Amen. 
Last two Sundays ago, two Sundays ago, I preached for Jabula International in New York City. And I wept because uh, I, I don't know why the Lord has chosen me. Our, our ministry is officially in 27 countries. And there were men that had come from Argentina, from Chile, from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Guatemala. All of them who have heard of me, they wanted to meet me first and to say, we, we want to have said, we have met our spiritual father. And that's very hard knowledge and stuff for me as an individual to take because I'm a very uh, quirky person, <laughs> to say the least. And I don't take uh, the kind of honor and bowing and all of that. I, I don't take too much to that. But I receive these individuals, and so we have committed now, next year, we will be 44 years, right? <laughs> 42 years married next year. I thought it was 44. I think, I think the COVID here added so much on our lives. <laughs> and so I'm going with Cheech. We're going to Buenos Aires, to Jabula in Argentina, Jabula in San Diego. And then from there, I'm taking her for our 42nd anniversary. <laughs> I'm taking her to Hawaii. And when I announced that, at the Jabula conference, there was a person from Hawaii that said, we've been praying for you to come to Hawaii and preach to us there. So uh, I said, uh, we, we don't mix business with pleasure. <laughs> Father, the revival that you have promised us, we receive it. We take it. We thank you for trusting us with it. I pray for John Kilpatrick on this platform that you bless the revival that's happening in his church. Let them see that revival. Let them see it. Give him another chance to manage it well. Organize them from Cape Town all the way through to Cairo. Let our continent be ablaze with revival by your grace and by your spirit.